Thank you, everyone. It's great being here. It's wonderful. Now I understand why people retire in Naples, Florida. <laughs> like, everyone loves the weather here. It's amazing. Great. So my name is Andre, and I am a Bible teacher and tour guide, but I had the privilege to be born in Jerusalem in a place called the Via Dolorosa. Have you heard about the Via Dolorosa? The Stations of the Cross, where Jesus went all the way from condemnation to Calvary, 14 stations. And station number eight happened to be my home. So I have been with a lot and seen a lot of tourists, American tourists, <laughs> coming to the land since I was a kid. And it happened that because I was in, born in that part of the world, that I speak different languages. Now, I'm a Maronite indigenous believer. A Maronite. A Maronite is not Mennonite. It's way different. A Maronite, we are back from the early church. Originally, we are Phoenicians. Remember the Syrio-Phoenician woman in the Bible? And it happens in my home church, the Maronite church, we speak Aramaic. Remember, Jesus spoke many languages, minimum three languages. He spoke Greek, he spoke, spoke Hebrew, and he spoke Aramaic. Greek will be the international language, like the English. Everywhere you go, everyone speaks English. That was during the Greek Roman Empire. And Hebrew was the language of the synagogues and the rabbis and the scribes. The upper class language, and Aramaic was the Lunga Franca, the local language. And I grew up in that church speaking Aramaic. So I want to teach you a few words in Aramaic. <clears throat> a, I want to tell you good evening in Aramaic and Hebrew and show you how, and maybe show you how sentences Jesus pronounced from his own mouth. All right? So I'll start with Aramaic. Ramsho, say Ramsho. Briho means good evening. One more time. Ramsho Briho. Ho, say ha ha. You have to not ha ha. Ha, you pronounce it from the bottom of your throat and push air out. It's different muscles. I know ha Briho, which literally means. Good evening, but in Aramaic means a blessed evening. So if Jesus is standing here, he will tell his disciples, Ram Briho, blessed evening. And the disciples will answer him, Brih we Brih. Say, Brih we Brih. Not Brih, Brih. Brih we Brih, which means blessed indeed. Now in Hebrew is Erev Tov. Erev Tov. But I want to go, Hebrew and Aramaic is into layers. The Bible was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, right? Old Testament, we have Daniel, Aramaic, and we have also Hebrew. But when we understand the Aramaic and the Jewish roots of Jesus, we can connect with him more because the writers of scripture, of Torah, were from the East. So if you understand the culture and the custom and the context of Jesus, we understand him in a deeper way. And this is why I'm here. I'm just going to teach you what a different layer of what is good evening. Brih we brih come from every Hebrew letter and Aramaic letter have roots. Every Aramaic word have roots, three letters or four letters, because it's Semitic languages. And brih come from bet. Resh het, which literally means a knee. So when Jesus is telling them, because how they prayed in the first century, Jesus tell us, go to your room and pray. There were no churches at that time. Churches started to come in the fourth century. And they go to your room, to their rooms, lock their rooms, and bow down on their knees and pray. So they humble themselves in reading Torah and where no one sees them. And when Jesus is telling them, 
Good evening, blessed evening. They answer, blessed indeed, which means we are obedient to you. We're humbling ourselves to hear from you. So this is how Aramaic and Hebraic is into layers. So I can teach you more words, but more I'm gonna speak a little bit about my background, and I'm gonna share my story, my testimony, my background. I am from Israel, right? What is Israel in Hebrew? Anyone know? So if you know the meaning of the word, you understand exactly the depth of scripture. In Hebrew, ish, ra, el. Say ish, ish. Ra, ra, el. Everyone knows what's el, God. Ish means man, ra means strong. Israel literally means the strong man of God. Remember when Jacob fought with the angel? His name turned from Yaakov, Jacob, to Israel, the strong man of God. And not only I'm from Israel, I am from Jerusalem. In Hebrew, Or Shalim. In Aramaic, Or Shlim. Or means light, Shlim. Remember this word Shalom? In Hebrew, in Aramaic, Shlama. And it literally means complete. Or means light. Shalem is complete. Jerusalem is the city of wholeness, completion. When you come to Israel and visit Jerusalem, you feel home. It's not the peace that is outside. It's deeper than peace. It's the peace that you're content in your life, even if the circumstances around you are not working good, but from inside, you have the deep peace. And Or Shlem, no wonder why it have this name, because we never had peace there. <laughs> it's the most conflict place on earth. This is where history started, Jerusalem, and where history will end. No wonder why God has sent his only son to Jerusalem. So what's more important in Jerusalem? What is the most important thing for us as believers in Jerusalem? Mount Moriah. What happened at Mount Moriah? The temple where the presence of the Lord, the Holy of Holies. By the way, this is the old city, and Jerusalem is very important for three religions. It's important for Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And here is the Christian quarter down, and up is the Muslim quarter, and to the right here, then by the western wall, the Jewish quarter. So my home is literally, you can't see it, but in this location. So I lived in the Christian quarter, one block far from the Holy Sepulchre. You know what is the Holy Sepulchre? Golgotha. So that was my playground, and Jerusalem was my battleground. As a happy boy, I have a twin brother, identical twin brother. And we are happy boys playing on the streets of the Via Della Rosa, playing hide and seek on pillars and stones from the first, second, third century. And many tourists, American tourists, were lost. You know why? Because Jerusalem is like a maze. And you know why? Because they're adventurous. So as happy boys, they, told, they asked us questions. Show me where is Jaffa Gate? Take us to the Holy Sepulchre where Jesus was crucified. And we used to show them their destination. And our vocation, our destiny became tour guides. <laughs> so this is on the roofs of one of the churches. And here is the Christian quarter, and this is the Holy Sepulchre where Jesus, Jesus was buried and crucified and resurrected. It's a small place here. And this is in one of the groups I took around doing the Stations of the Cross. And as a young boy, I saw a lot of groups 
taking their cross and sad all the time. So I wondered in these streets why they are sad. I saw a lot of Catholic groups. And then I saw a lot of evangelical groups. They're happy all the time. And they're celebrating victory. So in my heart, living at that stations of the cross, my heart was to write about it because that is where I grow up. And this is station number eight. And we want to tell you that we Aramean Christians that speak the languages, it's not that we are special, not at all. We're special because we know and have personal relationship with Jesus. But in my home church, the Aramaic Syriac Maronite Church, the liturgy we recite in Aramaic is the same liturgy of St. James, the brother of Jesus. So we have unbroken footprints in following the steps of Jesus throughout the pages of the Bible. And this is my community, some of my friends, and our ancestors go all the way back to the early church. I can tell you we still carry the scent of Jesus in our lives. Now, I was here for a while last year, because I'm a teacher, I go and teach, and I was here and I heard about the ancestry test, the DNA test. And I thought it was like a hoax or... Because I'm not from here. I'm from Jerusalem. And I want to check it. So to make the story short, I, Amazon Prime is like magic. Enter there. <laughs> and I received the kit and sent it. After three weeks, the results came back. I was not in a shock. The results came back 100% from the Middle East. Now, there's nothing 100%. Usually it comes 30% German, 20% Irish. It proves that my mom and my dad, we are from North Israel originally, like what I was sharing with people. Our identity goes back to the early church. So we are, we share, we are the closest and geographical neighbors to the Jewish believers in Israel because our liturgy is like St. James, same, the same liturgy of the brother of Jesus. Now, of course, I'm a Bible teacher, I'm a preacher by heart too, and I'm going to share with you who are the Arameans, all right? They are descendants from Aram, from Aram, and who was Aram in the Bible? Genesis 24, 10, because I like to solidify what I am teaching in Scripture. Then the servant left, talking with him, ten of his master's camels, loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. He set out from Araim Naharaim and made his way to the town of Nahur. Aram Naharaim is Aramaic word. Naharaim in Aramaic and Hebrew means the two rivers, the Tigritis and the Ephrates River. This is the area where Abraham came from, the Ur of the Chaldeans, all the way here and traveled with the water, with the rivers, and went to Haran here. But all this area was called Nahar, Aram Naharaim. Why do you think the language was of Abraham at that time? Many scholars were debating what was his language. Is it Hebrew? Is it Aramaic? Because Aramaic is older and more ancient. And look what the Bible tells us. Many Christians do not see that. And it's so clear in our Bibles. Look what it says. Deuteronomy 26.5. Then you shall declare before the Lord, your God, my father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down into Egypt. Of course, that was Abraham. With a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. My father was a wandering Aramean. The Bible was written later, not in Hebrew. But the original language of all Aram Naharaim was Aramaic. And that was La Lunga Franca of Jesus. And till now, I tell you, there is people still speak Aramaic. Now, who was Aram? The sons of Shem, El Am. Notice my pronunciation is different than your English pronunciation. Ashur, Arfahad, Lud, and Aram. So one of the five 
sons of Shem was Aram. He was the first son. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gesher, and Meshech. Now, every one of you knows Aramaic. Because it's written in the Bible. Remember this saying, Eli, Eli, Lumash Baktani. You remember that, what Jesus said on the cross? Now, the Greek translator, remember the Septuagint? The Greeks that translated all the books into Greek, and they burnt the Aramaic and the Hebraic scripture and the scrolls because they want the Greek culture to invade the East. The Jews did not like that. The Arameans, we did not like that because they're invaders. And they translated the Bible to Greek. The Greek translator was not aware of the Aramaic words that Jesus said on the cross. And of course, Jesus will say, Aramaic, because when you are in the, on the cross, you're in agony. What happens in agony? All your feelings will come out. You go out with your mother tongue, with your longa franca. And in Aramaic, there is layers. Shbak in Aramaic means set me aside. Another layer of shbak. Every Aramaic word has a root letter. This is sheen, beth, Kof, shbak. Shbak means kept me. Jesus said, I know now why you set me aside, why you kept me. He put it all together in that moment when he see it all, that revelation. Of course, he was complete human and complete God. But at that moment, he surrendered himself because the father will never forsake the son. If you're a father, you will never forsake your son. So when you go back to the Hebraic and Aramaic roots of Scripture, more clarity, more confirmation, more correction will take place in your life. Another Aramaic words, Matthew 19, 24. Jesus once said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Camel in Aramaic is not... Camel, it's gamlo. Gamlo literally means a thick rope. But the Greek translator was not aware of the depth of the language. And a thick rope, look what it says. Jesus once said, it is easier for a thick rope to go through the eye of a needle, which means the rich will enter the kingdom of heaven. But then, you know, if you have a needle and a thick rope, it will take endurance. Take more time to enter it. They will have the kingdom of heaven. So when you know the original languages, you will understand more about scripture. I will be doing a teaching in depth more on Wednesday, but this is only just to let you how much language is important. I'm going to continue. Because you know Aramaic more than you think. Talita kumi, right? Talita kumi. Kumi literally means wake up. Little girl, wake up. There's so many Aramaic words that you are aware of, but you don't understand the meanings from Scripture. So when you go back to the culture, when you go back to the customs and the contents of Scripture, you understand Jesus in a deeper way. And it happens to be my background. What was Jesus' background? In Nazareth, most people were farmers. Hundred years ago here, there were farmers, right? There were a lot of cows and a lot of, like, uh, simple life. That was the life of Jesus. Jesus always spoke from the culture of the people farming. And Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. That is the Greek translation. Now, don't, do not misunderstand me. It's not wrong. It's not that we scripture have it wrong. No, God works with every culture. The Bible words never changes. But when we go back in history, we understand Jesus' culture, we get deeper into scripture. We are thinking in the 21st century, but God's words work in every century. Amen. Jesus said, I am the Olaf and the Tau. The Olaf is the first letter in Aramaic. In Hebrew, Ani, Ha'alef, Vihatet. In Aramaic, Olaf and the Tau. What is Olaf? Olaf 
is the beginning of an agricultural path today in Israel, in archaeology. When we do excavations, in every path in our agriculture, we find the beginning sign of the letter Olaf. And the letter Olaf, the sign, is every Aramaic word and Hebraic word have a meaning. Olaf literally means the oxen, the oxen, the animal, because he's important in every village. You need it for fertility, you need it for breeding. It's the most important thing in the first century. And we see the sign and the drawing of the oxen at the beginning of the path, and we sign drawings of the tau. Tau literally means end of a path. So when Jesus is saying, I'm the Olaf, and I am the Tao, this is what the farmers use. So I am the beginning of your path and the end of your life. I am sufficient for everything. So that was the Lunga Franca. That was what Jesus was talking with simple people. So I'm going to go now to share my testimony, part of my story. This is the old city of Jerusalem and is divided into three major quarters. We have the Muslim quarter, and we have the Christian quarter, and we have the Jewish quarter, where the three religions started in a small place. Probably the vicinity of this church might be the size of the old city of Jerusalem. And is where Christian quarter, the Holy Sepulchre, and we have the Muslim quarter, the famous Dam of the Rock, and the Jewish quarter, the Western Wall. And we have eight gates surrounding the walls of Jerusalem. It's so small. It's only all together, the wall, circumstances, around three, two and a half miles, not more, even two miles, all around. And it happened that a new gate was the Christian Quarter Gate, you see some of the nuns leaving from the church here, and this is my school. So I grew up as a Maronite, Aramaic speaking, and we have to go to a Catholic school. There's no other schools we can go to. And once, my school is not far from home, and once I heard one of my friends at school saying that Jesus was a Jew. I was like seven, eight years old. I was in a shock. I thought Jesus was an Aramean. This is what my priest told me. So I ran from school all the way back home. It's five minutes. I made it in two minutes. <laughs> and my dad was sitting as, at his reclining chair. And I told my dad, Father, Father, was Jesus Jewish? He opened his eyes. He, and then he said yes and closed his eyes. I was in another shock. My dad even telling me that? I said, maybe his mom, not his father. My dad said, no, both his mom and his father are Jewish. I said, why you didn't tell me so far? I was like, so young. He said, you were so young to hear this. And from that moment, I started to learn languages. I started to understand the Jewish roots of our Christian faith. And it brought more clarity to my Christian walk. And for me, as an Aramean Christian, a local believer Christian, the Jews are my enemies. And the one who I love the most, I don't know if you grab hold of this, the one who I love the most, Jesus, was a Jew. That was hard for a young boy to comprehend that. This is part of the Christian quarter, how it looks, the roads of the old city. Then, after I finished school, I went to a university. And it was a Catholic university. For us as Christians, indigenous, we only go to the missionary universities. And the Catholic invested mostly in schools, mostly in hospitals and in universities. So we get to get the best education because they invested in us. We speak minimum three, four, five languages. At the school in the university, I saw a bunch of students all together. And these students were so happy. Now, there was the Intifada. None of you know what is the Intifada. We have conflict in that part of the world. 
An intifada are the riots. There was the first intifada and the second intifada. I'm going to share two milestones of my testimony. And these students are so happy, despite we have to study a lot of books, and they are throwing stones at the army and the soldiers. And it's oppressive. And they are still happy. So I had the courage to go to them and tell them, what is the secret of your happiness? I need to know. Everything is like depressive outside. It's dark and a lot of riots. And you are here in another world. They told me we are Christians. I told them, I am a Christian too, but not happy like you. No, tell me more. There should be more. And I am proud of my Christianity. I have Jesus. I know I speak Aramaic. I speak his language, Hebrew. He said, no, no, no. You have to have a personal relationship with Jesus. I said, what? Tell me more. And I accepted the Lord Jesus in my life. And one of the guys told me, repeat this after me. And the moment I repeated that, I felt the complete peace of the Lord over me. Next week, I told my twin brother, Tony, he made fun of me. But after that, he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in his heart. The week after, me and my twin brother were leading the Bible studies in Bethlehem University. And we were praying for the Jews, the soldiers, to know the Messiah. Upside down kingdom. So, this is where I accepted the Lord in this university. And I'm going to share the two milestones. The first one during the first intifada. And the second milestone during the second intifada. Today is much more peaceful. So what I'll share you was before, all right? And, you know, a lot of riots taking place during the first intifada. And you heard probably that you saw in the news a lot. And I don't know if you know about settlers, if you're aware. There are settlers that go to West Bank, and they do fake checkpoints. And in these fake checkpoints, they see who is passing there. If they realize you're not Jewish, you're going to be in trouble. And one day in the first intifada, we don't hear the news because we are used to that. There were Palestinians that killed two Jews. So now the settlers want to revenge. I used to have an old car and wanted to fix my car in West Bank. So we don't hear the news because it's daily news, you know. And I went there and I was stuck in one of the fake checkpoints. Then I saw one of the Settlers, settlers means settle, they go and settle in locations that they don't belong to. And they are against the government, you know, the settlement issues in Israel. And they are kind of extreme. And I saw the mother coming with a slab of stone on my car. Thank the Lord that the car was not, the windows was not destroyed. Then I saw small kids coming, throwing stones. And then I see the father. I looked at his eyes. I saw the hatred coming from his eyes. And he started to come near by me, and he put his right hand on the gun. This is the moment I knew I was in trouble. What do you do? I closed my eyes and start to pray. And the moment I opened my eyes, the army came. And when the army comes, all the settlers will run away because what they are doing is illegal. Then I had a struggle in my heart. I was almost going to die. What am I going to do? I wanted to curse them. My flesh was starting to work. Then I saw in my mind Jesus on the cross saying, forgive them, Father, because they don't know what they're doing. And when I pray the same prayer, I felt again the same peace when I first accepted Jesus. Felt in the car and then continued my, to my work. I was late five minutes to my job. And there at my job, there was a religious Jew. But we call him Messianic Jews. You know what is a Messianic Jew? Is someone, a Jew, and he lives in a settlement. And he's one of my best friends. He knows Jesus as a personal savior. And I, he prayed with me and he asked forgiveness 
for them. And then I felt really healed. So here I am, young. I was almost going to lose my life because of a fanatic Jew. Second milestone, during the second intifada. That was much more harder intifada. Now, I don't want you to be sad. I'm sharing this testimony just to increase your faith. All right? This is my main, main purpose, to encourage you to walk with Jesus. And I was in Zion Square. This is West Jerusalem. And the second intifada was suicide bomb attacks. And I was in December 2nd, 2001, in that location. You can Google it, December 2nd, 2001. And I felt something wrong. You know, sometimes in your guts, you feel the atmosphere, there's something wrong. And I heard a voice coming to my ear, Andre, move right now, like an order. I didn't listen. Then I heard the same voice after two seconds stronger. Andre, move right now. I didn't hear. I thought my friend is talking to my ears because he was following me. Then after two seconds, something literally pushed me to the other side. I thought my friend is pushing me. I looked back, he's following me. A bomb attack took place. Ten people died. Then, I wanted to run away because all the crowds are running away. And the same voice came to me, Andre, stand still. I listened this time. <laughs> I stood still. And I looked at my body from my toes all the way up. I was complete. I said, Lord, I'm going to be fully for you. And that moment, I saw my life like a movie in colors. What did I do for the kingdom? And a second bomb attack took place. And then me and my friend went all the way through a bypass, and we went back home to Jerusalem. The old city is seven minutes from there, from West Jerusalem. I could not tell my family for two months what took place. But here I was going to die again, because of a fanatic Muslim. Why me, Lord? I am, you know, we Christians, to be very honest with you, we're cowards, all right? All the Christians in Jerusalem left Jerusalem because they want a better life. Who is staying there? The believers. Because we know we have a calling on our life. It took me a while to understand what was the calling on my life. Today, my best friend, is a Muslim. He used to work with the PLO. You know what's the PLO? And today he's saved by the blood of Christ. And my other best friend is a Jew who rides an army tank in the Golan Heights. And when we all meet together, the three of us, the presence of the Spirit is there. Unity brings down the Spirit of the Lord. And the only peace, the only shlama, the only shalom we have is in Jesus. Because in Him we can forgive. And I knew I had on my life a calling for reconciliation. To bring, we the locals, we can speak both languages. We can bring the both into one new man. And look what Scripture says. That's the heart of God. That's the peace of Jerusalem. That's what the Lord wants from our lives, to be praying for the peace. For He Himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one. Which two groups? Jews and Gentiles. All right? And has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, 
thus making peace. I want to get you to the core of the conflict because it's all spiritual. And the church of the West need to connect with the church of the East because we need people to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The core of the conflict is the two brothers. Remember, Abraham had two sons. Had Ishmael, who was the firstborn, and he was born from Hagar. She was a servant. And we have Isaac, it's Hak, was born from Sarah. Now, just to let you know, both have promises, but both they need to know the Messiah. From Ishmael, the Muslim nation came, and from Isaac, the Jewish nation came. I'm going to tell you some, and I'm an author, right? I'm a writer. I'm going to take you back 3,000 years ago, 3,800 years ago to the days of Abraham. Just tell you two stories out of my imagination for you to understand a little bit the core of the conflict. Ishmael was born first. He's physically stronger. But he feels less. Why he feels less? Because his mom is a servant. And Sarah many times will not treat him well. For example, at breakfast, for the people who have been in the Holy Land, we have goat milk. I don't know if you know the goat milk. It smells so bad, but tastes so good. <laughs> anyway, she brought for him and for Isaac a bowl of goat milk for breakfast. And Ishmael is stronger and bigger. His portion was less than the portion of Isaac. Of course, it hurted him from inside. He went to his mom, telling him what happened with him. His mom said, you have to be quiet. And this is why the Muslim nation in general, they want to shout out loud. They are hurt. No one is listening to them because they feel less. They need to be healed by the power of Jesus. And Isaac was like seeing everything and he was watching everything and laughing. Pride. He had pride. The Jewish nation today, without knowing the Messiah, they have pride. They think they are chosen. They think they are going to heavens because they inherit. They have the inheritance. They're Jews, chosen, right? But they have so much pride. And Isaac, he has so much pride. And he wants to show off. You know, in the Middle East, we have camels. One story on a side, just to understand the, the Bible. He wants to run all the way to a top of a camel. You know, a camel, you can't ride a camel unless he's down. Because it takes him a while to go up. But Isaac wants to show he's strong, right? And he starts running all the way. I wanted to jump to the camel. The moment he wanted to jump to the camel, he twisted his ankle and fell down. And he was crying. Ishmael was watching him from afar. Do you think Ishmael did do anything to him? He said, you deserve it. You're full of pride. I'm not helping you. These same stories, to a different measures, happens today in Jerusalem, in daily life. But we need the church in the West to pray for Jerusalem. It's a commandment in the Bible. Because when we pray, a revelation takes place to the Jewish people and to the Muslim nation to know their Messiah. So my heart is a reconciling heart. And I tell you, to live in Jerusalem is so hard. If I was not a believer, I will not stand in Jerusalem one more day. But because I know I have a calling on my life to bring this peace. And everyone steps on us in Jerusalem. We are like a bridge between the two. But when they step on us, it makes us stronger. The more persecution you have in your Christian walk, the more grace and the more you depend on the Holy Spirit. God blessed the Western church for a reason, to be a blessing to Israel. This is two Jewish kids, one Muslim kid and one a Jewish kid. Reconciliation can take place. That's the real solution. 
And here's another picture of a Jewish kid and a Muslim kid down playing together. This is my book I wrote about one Friday in Jerusalem. Anyway, I would like to end and pray. And the reason I shared my story, I want you to be encouraged. And I want you to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 122. It's a commandment. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It's not the peace of the politics in Hebrew and Aramaic. It's the peace between the people in Jerusalem, between you and God. That's the shlama. That is the real reconciliation. When Jesus was teaching at the Sermon on the Mount, he said, the English-Greek translation, Blessed are you, the poor in the spirit, for yours the kingdom of heaven. In original Aramaic and Hebrew, is not blessed. It's joy. Joy for the poor in the spirit. Every time you read the Sermon on the Mount, put joy. The Lord wants us to pray with joy to the peace. And the poor is not poor like you think in English. Poor is simple and content. And he's saying, joy for the simple, because they have the kingdom of heaven. You know that Jesus mentioned the kingdom of heaven more than 200 times. You know, born again Christian, how much is mentioned twice. I want to teach you, like I promised in the beginning, sentences Jesus spoke from his own mouth. And then I pray. Say, Malchut, Shamayim. Again, Malchut, Shamayim. Scholars today know sentences Jesus spoke from his heart, from his mouth. Malchut means kingdom. Shamayim means heavens. In every Malchut, in Hebraic mindset, there should be three things in every kingdom. There should be a king, right? There should be people following the king, citizens. And there should be a place in every kingdom. Who is our king? Who are the citizens in the kingdom? Where is this kingdom? Here, now. J Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Hebrew, Malchut Shamayim Karov. Stretch your hands like this. Say, stretch your hands like this. Kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does it mean it's at hand? It means you can touch it. It means it's here. It means in Aramaic and Hebrew, it's a present reality. When you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you're going to have peace inside you. And you're going to bring Malchut Shamayim. You're going to bring the kingdom of heaven to your life and live in the present moment. Do not live in the past. There are so many people live in the past. And there are so many people live in the future. Jesus said, live now. It's here. It's about today. And when Jesus was teaching, joy to the simple, for there is the kingdom of heaven. The Jews at that time were oppressed, were under occupation, right? The disciples, he gave them joy. He under they understood his words. And this is why they followed Jesus. Because he got them freedom. Freedom from what? Not from the Roman occupation, not from Caesar, but from sin. Because sin is a source of occupation. Anyway, another word in Hebrew and Aramaic. Sin in Hebrew and Aramaic means het. Het. Het literally means missing the mark. Missing the point. If we sin in our lives, we get distracted. But God has a redemptive spirit. He will redeem us. What is Torah in Hebrew? Torah is life. If you go back to the roots, three letters. Torah, three letters. Yud, 
Resh Yud means Yare. What is Yare is shooting. God shooted Torah on Mount Sinai to Moses, right? And Moses went down to the 12 tribes. And from the 12 tribes of Israel to the 70, to the 120, to the, all the Jewish nation and to the world. Jesus on Mount Sinai himself became Torah. Himself became life. He went with the message to the 12 disciples, to the 70, to the outer circle, 120, and to all the Jewish people and all over the Gentiles. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. You know what is the original Hebrew? It says, I came to give the right interpretations of Moses' Torah, not the law. The law is a Greek translation from a Greek word called namos. Imagine you are in a court with a judge. This is the law. It sounds negative. You will fear the judge. You're serving God out of fear. That's the law. But with Jesus as Torah, as life, you serve him out of love. When you serve your creator out of love, you can serve him completely and have complete joy. But when you serve out of fear, like the Jews, the religious Jews and the religious Muslims, you will never be happy. You will never be full of joy. Now, Torah, it's very hard to say it in one word in English. Torah is direction, instruction, guidance. If I put it in three words. Remember the word dig. You always dig deep. You know, in archaeology, we dig deeper. So you always dig in the Torah, in the Word of God, because it brings you life. The more time you read Scripture, the more life you will have. You will have directions. Remember Moses had directions where to go and how to build the tabernacles. He had instructions, and he had guidance by the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself became Torah. He gave us direction. He gives us instructions. He gives us guidance to our life. The more Torah, the more life. You know this verse very well in the West. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But we always take things out of context. You know the paragraph before it, what it says? If you study my words, which means if you spend time reading Torah, then, it's a conditional statement, then you will know the truth, and then the truth will set you free. I'm just giving you Hebraic, Aramaic examples of what Jesus meant by Torah. He is Torah. He is life to us. So I want to encourage you, get deeper in the Hebraic, Aramaic way of thinking of Jesus Christ, the culture and the custom and the context of Scripture you will understand and revelation takes place into your lives. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, because you are God that speaks and revelation takes place. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today. Thank you for this revelation that come to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for all the ears that we're hearing today and your spirit is touching their hearts. Thank you for the life they have. We pray for directions. We pray for instructions. We pray for guidance, Lord. And thank you for the anointing you have on them, on, on this church. Lord, let them be a blessing to people here in Naples, Florida. Let their lives be a testimony of the page of the Bible. And I pray for joy for them to be content in what they have and to pray for the shlama, for the shalom of Jerusalem, because everyone can be Jerusalem, and they are Jerusalem when they pray for the peace where you went down to bring the message of salvation to the world. In the name of Yeshua, Amshihu, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.